Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar, an introduction to the UK Data Service. My name is Anna, and I am a member of the UK Data Service Access Team as a Data Access and Use Assistant. I am presenting today with my colleague, Tracy. Hello, everyone. I'm also a member of the UK Data Service Access Team as a Data Access News Assistant. Today we'll be delivering a quick introduction to the UK Data Service. We will be going over who we are, what data we hold and what resources we have available. Okay, so what we'd like to know before we get started on the webinar today is what type of user are you? You can free tap your responses in here just to let us know whether you're staff at university, studying for masters, PhD, maybe you're a commercial user. It'd be great to know what your background is. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Thanks for that. So it's good to see we've got a good mix of attendees today. We would also like to know if you have tried to find and access data with the UK data service prior to attending this webinar. Okay, so it's great to see that some of you have. It's looking like more of you haven't. So hopefully the information that we give to you today will help you find and access data that we hold in our catalogue. If um, you did try and access the data, did you find what you wanted? We do have a large um, catalogue of data on lots of different themes, and, and we hope that you were able to find some data that was useful for you. You can see lots of great answers here. That's really good. And again, we hope that uh, if you weren't able to find what you wanted, we hope that this webinar will help you in the future to find the data that you're looking for from our service. Just that a couple more of you answer. Perhaps you could just help us with a maybe just a brief idea of, of why you couldn't find what you were looking for. Maybe it was, um, maybe the web, you didn't find the website very clear to use. Maybe the search function wasn't what you were expecting. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay. We'll, we'll be running through some information on different areas of our website today. So hopefully that will help you in the future. Okay, great. That's great. Thanks very much. Any more answers? Any, anyone else want to write down anything or are we? Okay, I think we're good. Lots of great answers. Thank you very much. We would also like to know the kind of data that you are looking at. Um, I know a lot of people have a lot of different research needs and um, there are lots of wonderful topics uh, being researched, which is really good. So we do just want a brief overview of uh, the type of data that you're looking at. Okay, that's great. And we'll be covering some of those those areas today. Here is an 
overview of the topics that we will be covering throughout this webinar. We will be explaining a, a bit about who we are and what we do, what secondary data is, what sort of data we hold, as well as talking you th through the online resources that we have and a little bit of the guidance that we can provide you with. There will be time for questions at the end. So, what is the UK Data Service? The UK Data Service is the principal repository for economic population and social research data in the UK. We are pioneers in data curation and actively managing long-term access to high quality data. Our expertise continues to transform social science research, teaching and learning. Our training, policies and protocols have been used by international research organisations and researchers ever since the founding of the UK Data Service at the University of Essex in 1967. The UK Data Service is funded by UK Research and Innovation and builds on investments from the Economic and Social Research Council to meet the data needs of researchers, students and teachers from all sectors. Our well-established data skills training provide the necessary skills and knowledge to inform research for those new to data use by our comprehensive learning resources, training events, on-demand webinars and with video tutorials around the key data types and themes and online support to get the most out of the UK Data Service. We are experts on safe research, working closely with HMRC Data Lab and the Office for National Statistics Secure Research Services to develop safe research protocols, including the five safes framework to enable secure research access to data while protecting confidentiality. We have decades of experience in all aspects of data curation, digital preservation, data access and user support. Our collection includes major UK government sponsored surveys, cross national surveys, longitudinal studies, UK census data, international aggregate data, business data and qualitative data. The UK Data Service Impact Team is expert at understanding and supporting the development of evidencing and promoting the impact of the use of data in the collection, in research, teaching and policy making and the impact of the service as an ESRC funded data infrastructure. Our focus is on the demonstrable contribution of the service and its data and resources make to the economy, society, culture, public policy and services, health, the environment and quality of life. We work with researchers with a range of experience and in different fields to showcase the impact of their data enhanced research through developing case studies. We encourage discussion and debate of concepts, challenges and issues in the realms of data impact and data policy theory through the data impact blog. Currently, we are showcasing poverty in data, housing and homelessness in data, and mental health in data. The blog is run by the UK Data Service and is a hub for researchers, students, communities, policy makers, 
government and anyone interested in maximising the impact of social population and economic data in research and policy. We hope to encourage debate, share innovation and best practice and keep the community up to date with news, events and the latest data-driven impactful research and policy making. Our homepage is designed to be easy to navigate and user friendly. There is a menu across the top of the page to navigate your way around, depending on which topics you're interested in. There is a search bar to search the data catalog and you can use the study number if you know it, the data owner, for example, understanding society to bring up a list of data sets or a topic such as poverty. As you scroll down the home page, there are links to the latest highlights, upcoming training and events, our impacts, the learning hub, the latest data collections and new additions, and a link to our training webinars. There is a yellow login button in the top right hand corner where you can log in and register. We will go over that later in the presentation. The help tab is also very useful and again we will look at this in more detail later. Moving forward from this we will discuss who the UK data service is for, who can register and who can access our catalogue. Researchers, students and teachers from any discipline, organisation or country may register with the UK data service and obtain data. Some data sets have res restrictions on access due to the data redistribution license agreements with uh, the data providers, but anyone can access our data catalogue and browse our data sets. Most of our regular users are affiliated with higher education or further education institutions, staff, researchers, students, but anyone and everyone can register with us. We have many users from other sectors, such as local and national government departments, charities and think tanks. You can also register if you are a commercial user, but there may be some restrictions as to what you can access and there may be a fee to do so if the intended usage of, of the data is for commercial purposes. We also have the option for research is not associated with an organisation to join us to pursue their interests. We are really keen for people to explore data, learn new things and improve their data skills. We will now share with you some information on secondary analysis and I will also present the different types of data we hold at the UK Data Service. We host a large collection of secondary data, which is data that has already been collected for a previous study by a different researcher. Research data can be collected across a range of social science disciplines using a variety of research methods. Social surveys and interviewing projects represent some of the most common methods, but you can also collect data through admin records, business records and censuses. The reason why secondary data is so valuable to researchers is that primary collection can be time consuming or expensive and requires a certain level of expertise to be carried out properly. 
In contrast, secondary analysis or the reanalysis of data that has been collected previously can be used by new researchers looking to answer a new research question and is more often than not free and can be found and accessed through many sources. Using existing data can also enable research where the data may be difficult or impossible to collect. Like in the case of global admin data, large scale surveys or historic data. Using secondary data is also favored by researchers as there is a wide range of topics and formats available to work with. And if it comes from a reliable source, it can be representative, robust and transparent. That means that all the information on how the data was collected and sampled and all other details needed to conduct research with it will also be available within the study in the documentation section of the data set. This is the role that the UK Data Service plays. We facilitate access to this secondary data and can also provide advice and support through the application process for it. The data we hold comes from a wide range of sources and we are allowed to disseminate them under licence from the original data depositor. These are separated into end user licence studies, special licence studies and secure access data sets, each following a different procedure to apply and receive access to. We are hosting another webinar on the 20th of November called Finding and Accessing Data from the UK Data Service, where we will talk more in depth about the different levels of access and the application process for each type of data. If you are interested and would like to learn more about this webinar, you can check out the training and events section of our website for details. We have also included a link to the event at the end of our presentation. Back to secondary data, it is important to stress that we are not involved in the collection process of any of the data sets we hold. The data sets are deposited with us and we curate, preserve and catalogue them and make them available to researchers through the UK Data Service. Some of the most prominent sources the data we hold are national statistical authorities, UK government departments, intergovernmental organisation, research in institutes, including the Institute for Social and Economic Research and the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. Individual researchers may have done research for their masters, or their PhD, or their funded research. Researchers who are funded by the ESRC also deposit their data with us through ReShare, which is our online repository. Data deposited in this way is also available through our data catalogue. If you're wondering how many studies we hold in our catalogue, the answer would currently be more than 9,200 data sets. The Find Data tab on the home page has a section where you can browse and access data and by clicking through you will come to the Browse by Theme page. As you can see, we hold data on a number of topics, including ageing, COVID-19, crime, economics, 
environment and energy, education, ethnicity, food, health, housing, information and communication, labour, politics and poverty. You can also browse by data type, which we will cover further over the next few slides. Uh, we will be guiding you through the four types of data sets that you can find available through the UK data service. These are survey, micro data, international macro data, census data, and last but not least, qualitative and mixed methods data. The survey micro data includes major UK surveys, both cross national <coughs> and longitudinal. The international micro data includes multinational data banks and survey data. The census data is divided into aggregate data from 1971 to 2011, micro data from 1991 to 2011, flow data and boundary data. And finally, the qualitative and mixed methods section will be about a range of multimedia qualitative sources and a general mix of quantitative and, and qualitative data. <coughs> the UK Data Service holds a wide range of survey microdata. These are usually individual or household level data and that technically means that the data has been collected for an individual or a household that responded to the survey. An example would be a survey collecting data on age, home address, level of education and employment status. These variables would have to be recorded for each individual or group of individuals taking part in the survey. For this reason, the data has to be anonymised to prevent disclosure or make it not possible to identify the individuals that part in, took part in the survey from their responses. Survey microdata usually contain large samples and are nationally representative. This type of data is usually analysed using a statistics package like SPSS, STATA or R. Survey microdata can be really flexible as they allow you to produce your own tables and to look at the relationships between multiple attributes. For example, how someone's education status affects their income. Some of the most commonly used of our micro data are the UK surveys. Uh, the surveys are produced by experienced research organisations such as uh, the Office of National Statistics and the National Centre for Social Research, who have had many years of experience in sampling, data collection and analysis. Uh, they have their own methodologies researchers and teams of interviewers so this is very high quality data. These surveys are mostly nationally re representative at the UK level or the countries within the UK depending on the particular survey. They also tend to have a large sample sizes for example, the Labour Force survey interviews 60,000 people every quarter. 
there are two main types of these surveys that we are looking at today. These are cross-sectional and longitudinal. The longitudinal surveys can be broken down into cohorts and panel studies as well, which we will look at later on. Looking first at cross-sectional surveys, these collect data for a single point in time. A lot of the studies found in the UK Data Service catalogue are repeated cross-sectional surveys. Many of them are repeated annually or most years, but each time they are run, they use a new sample of people. They often use the same questions each time they run, so they can be used to track trends in the population over time. Here are some examples of our most widely used surveys. The Crime Survey for England and Wales provides an important source of information about the levels of crime, public attitudes to crime and other related issues. The results play an important role in informing government policy. The survey measures the amount of crime in England and Wales by asking people about the crimes that they have experienced in the last year. This includes crimes not reported to the police, so it is an important alternative to police records. A second example is the British Social Attitudes Survey. Since 1983, the British Social Attitudes Survey has been tracking the views and opinions of the public on the big issues facing the, the nation. Every year, the National Centre for Social Research invites the British public to share their views on a range of topics such as work, equalities, welfare, health, or even how the country is run. Households for this survey are randomly selected from across England, Scotland and Wales to take part in the study. This way we are able to get a truly unbiased picture of the attitudes in Britain. We will have a look at the crime survey for England and Wales in a bit more detail to give you a better overview of a particular data set. The Crime Survey for England and Wales is an example of a repeated cross-sectional survey and it is used to look at aggregate population changes over time. It samples those aged 16 and above, but since, 20, sorry, but since 2009, a smaller sample for those between 10 and 15 years of age was added. The survey collects information on whether the participants have been victims of crime or antisocial behaviour in the last 12 months. And interestingly, the question also covers topics such as demographics and other information, such as participants' attitudes towards the police or the criminal justice system as a whole. We have covered cross sectional surveys and now we are moving on to longitudinal, longitudinal data. These studies collect data through longitudinal surveys. Similar to cross sectional surveys, the longitudinal data also have large samples and are nationally representative. The one key difference between the two types of surveys, however, is that while cross 
sectional surveys and interview different individuals each year, L longitudinal surveys follow the same individuals or households over time and they ask the same questions. So data is collected on the same variables for the same individuals over an ex extended period of time. This makes it possible for researchers to observe change at the individual level over the observed period. For, for example, these data could help address questions like what factors earlier in your life can predict you having poor health when you are middle-aged. Like I mentioned before, there are two main types of longitudinal studies, panel studies and cohort studies. We are going to look at the differences between them in the following slides. Panel studies collect data at different waves which are different measurement points. The panel members interviewed are people sampled across the whole population of interest to include respondents of all ages. The frequency of the waves depends on the type and design of the study. For example, if you are dealing with an election study, you might want to ask the participants these questions several times throughout the election year to monitor if and how their views have changed. For that reason, the core content of the questions in a panel survey remains unchanged so that you can observe the changes in key measurements over time. But it is not uncommon for additional questions on different topics to be included in the survey. An example of that is if a researcher wants to investigate a particular issue and they can add new questions to a specific wave of the study. An, an example of a panel study is understanding society. <clears throat> this is a very popular data collection held by the UK Data Service and it is known as Understanding Society, the UK Household Longitudinal Study. It is the largest longitudinal household panel study and provides vital evidence on life changes and stability. The Understanding Society study is based at the in Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex. It follows participants over a long period of time, giving us a long term perspective on people's lives. It helps explore how life in the UK is changing and what stays the same over many years, interviewing everyone in a household to see how different generations experience life in the UK. The study helps find out about parents and children, siblings, new family formations and our wider family and community links. The sample size for the study is large. 40,000 households, which is around 100,000 individual interviews. This allows for researchers to investigate the it, experiences of different subgroups and ethnic minorities over time. The 
study also includes an ethnic minority boost sample and an, and a number of bio markers it also consents to be linked to administrative data such as health and education data topics covered by the study include the participants current employment and earnings benefit payments a political party identification household finances environmental behaviors parenting and child care arrangements family networks religion ethnicity and health <clears throat> another kind of a longitudinal study is the cohort study rather than waves the measurement points for cohort studies are generally called sweeps these type of studies follow individuals who have a particular event in common because they are interviewed at a key point in time they are interviewed less frequently than panel studies the most common event that these follow are people born in one week and a particular year and tracks them over time. Some will follow the cohort over their entire lifetime. These are called both birth cohort studies. Cohort studies tend to focus on topics regarding health and social and economic circumstances. Now we are going to cover the cover the three most popular cohort studies held by the UK Data Service. The first example is the 1958 National Child Development Study. This is following the lives of an initial 17,000 people born in England, Scotland, and Wales in a single week of 1958. It has collected information on their physical and educational development, economic circumstances, employment, family life, health behaviour, well-being, social participation, and attitude, attitudes. The study has become an invaluable data source on such topics as the effects of socioeconomic circumstances and child adversities on health and social mobility. It has also become an important resource for the study of genetics. <clears throat> the 1970 British cohort study uh, began in 1970 when the data was collected about the births and families of babies born in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in one a particular week in 1970. The first survey called the British Births Survey was carried out by the National Birthday Trust Fund in association with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Its aims were to look at the social and biological characteristics of the mother in relation to neonatal mor morbidity and to compare the results with those of the 1958 National Child Development Study. <coughs> The Millennium Cohort Study 
is the UK's newest longitudinal birth cohort study and follows the lives of a sample of babies born between the 1st of September 2000 and the 31st of August 2001 in England and Wales and between the 22nd of November 2000 and the 11th of January 2002 in Scotland and Northern Ireland. When the cohort members were young children, they were interviewed roughly every two years. At present, interviews take place roughly every three years. It aims to chart the conditions of social, economic and health advantages and, and disadvantages facing children born at the start of the 21st century. The study has been tracking the Millennium children through their early childhood years and plans to follow them into adulthood. It also provides a basis for comparing the patterns of development with the preceding cohort studies and the National Child Development Study and the 1970 Birth Cohort Study. There is another type of microdata that we want to mention briefly, and that's cross-national surveys. Cross-national surveys use the same survey instrument and where possible, the same methodology and fieldwork protocols. They allow for comparisons to be made across many countries and nations. Common topic topics covered include education, income, working conditions and poverty. Examples in our catalogue include the European Working Conditions Survey, European Quality of Life Survey, Young Lives, an International Study of Childhood Poverty, Young Lives School Survey, European Values Study and the National Youth Social Action Survey. The next type of data we are looking at is the internet in it, international macro data. Aggregate or macro data is data that has been aggregated to a country or regional level. Unlike micro data, which looks at the individual or household level. Macro data are time series data and depending on the database, they are available annually, quarterly or monthly. We are update this data regularly uh, with some databases being updated as frequently as every month. Our international macro data uh, contains socioeconomic time series data aggregated to a country or regional level for a range of countries over a substantial time period. Many uh, of the data banks are the current releases of the major statistical publications produced by intergovernmental organisations. Much of this data is only available through the UK Data Service to staff and students from UK higher or further education institutions. This is due to 
access conditions that are agreed with the data owners. However, data sources such as the World Bank databases are now open access. All the aggregate data banks contain time series data collectively charting over 50 years of global, social and economic change. The topics covered by them include national accounts, industrial production, employment, trade, demography, human development and other indicators of national performance and development. So, how can you access this data? You, you can download the data you require from visiting the International Aggregate Data Bank on the UK Data Service webpage. It hosts hundreds of economic and social data sets provided by the World Bank OEC D, International Monetary Fund, United Nations and International Energy Agency. You can view you could view the data by provider and it enables you to extract the information you require from the large socioeconomic international data sets available through the UK Data Service. There are a number of user guides and video tutorials to help you use it. There is also a video that can be found in the UK Data Service YouTube channel called Accessing, Exploring and Visualising International Data. We are now going to move to our third data type, which is census data. The census has a long history going back to 1801 and it takes place every 10 years. The census data for 2021 was released in July 2022. The UK Data Service has made the data tables and accompanying metadata available for download via the UK Data Service census site. The first release of data contains estimates of population by age and sex for both regions and local authorities in England and Wales. Forthcoming releases from the Office of National Statistics are expected to cover topics such as UK Armed Forces veterans, housing, health and unpaid care. The most novel feature of the 2021 census operations is that they have been designed from the outset to be digital first, with around 75% of the population expected to complete the questionnaire online. Additionally, the 2021 census is the first to include questions on sexual orientation and gender identity and respondents answered on an entirely voluntary basis. Census data aims to cover 100% of the population and it is used as a baseline for other statistics. It contains detailed combinations of characteristics in a range of topics. The data is available in many geographies and this makes it possible to reliably compare different areas which makes it so unique. Through the UK Data Service you can get access to four kinds of census data which are aggregate data, boundary data, flow data, and census microdata. Most of the data are now open access, although there may be some restrictions on some elements of the census data we have. Census aggregate data and census flow data are available to anyone under the open government license. Only registered users are able to access some of the data, such as boundary data. Census microdata have different access conditions depending on the data set of interest.
aggregate data provides counts, usually of individuals or households with particular characteristics for an area. These areas may be large or small. The benefit of having census data is that it allows you to be very flexible. So you may want to produce tables and graphs based on a very small population. For example, number of people who are aged over 50 and are unemployed within each of the wards in the district of Greater Manchester. In this example, the 50 and unemployed are a combination of characteristics and our geographical zones are the district of Greater Manchester. <coughs> If you're interested in using aggregate census data, then you can use INFUSE for 2001 and 2011. There is no update currently for 2021. You can see the interface on the slide here, and it is all done within your web browser by the UK Data Service website. INFUSE is designed to guide users in selecting census aggregate data relating to combinations of characteristics and areas of interest to them. You can pick your topics from the options shown on the screen and you can specify your parameters to produce outputs. We also provide access to various boundary data from 1981 to 2011 for a range of geographies. The boundaries are available in a range of geographic information system formats and can be explored through the boundary data selector on our website. This is currently available for the 1981, 1991, 2001 and 2011 census data as well as other boundaries. You can start by selecting the country you are researching, then the geography and the dates you are interested in. We have another video on the UK data service YouTube channel on how to download boundary data. If you are interested in boundary data, please do have a look at this as it can be a very helpful resource for this tool. <coughs> We are moving on to the next type of census data, which is what we call census flow data, also known as interaction data. These are data that relate to flows of people between places. Whereas most census data relate to counts of people at single locations, flow data describe interactions between two locations, the origin and destination. The most common flow data relate to migration, derived from place of residence on the census day compared with the usual residence in the previous year, and commuting flows, the difference between place of residence and place of work. Although data from the 2011 census also include information of movements between main and second addresses. Currently, migration and commuting data from the 1981, 1991, 2001 and 2011 censuses are available through WICID, our web-based interface to census interaction data. WICID is another flexible interface providing access to flow data. There are also some annual migration data derived from National Health Service patient patient registers that are available there too. The final 
type of census data we are looking at is census microdata. We provide access to cross sectional census microdata. These are anonymized individual level records sampled from the single census. They are large individual level files which resemble the sort of data that might be collected directly from a questionnaire. Because individual records contain a wide range of individual and household characteristics, the data enables multivariate analysis for a wide range of purposes. Census microdata tends to be more flexible as you can produce your own tables, populations and attributes. The UK Data Service holds contemporary data from the 1981 to 2011 censuses and micro data samples from the 1961 onwards. These used to be called SARS, which is samples of anonymized records. These are samples of one to five percent, depending on the data set produced by the census. Up updates are still on going for the 2021 census. Here are some topics that census microdata cover. These range from migration, education and employment to social class and income, language and geographic information. The last type of data to be covered today is qualitative and mixed methods data. Qualitative data is non-numeric information. These can be interview transcripts, diaries, anthropological field notes, answers to open-ended survey questions, audio or visual recordings and images. If you are, are looking for this type of data in our catalogue, you can filter your search by selecting qualitative or mixed methods as the type of data, or you can access them through the QualiBank. The QualiBank is a great tool that allows you to search for qualitative data, but also within qualit quali qualitative data for keywords and terms. In the example we can see on this slide, we have searched for the term ill health and got this essay as a result from the school leavers study of 1978. So you can use this as a way to narrow down your search and see if specific terms are mentioned within these resources. Now we are going to talk about how to register. As mentioned earlier, you will need to register to access some data sets within the UK Data Service. So for those of you not yet registered with us, this is how you can do so. You would need to find and click on the yellow login button as shown here. If you are a student or a member of staff at a UK institution of higher or further education, your inst institution is most likely a member of the UK Access Management Federation, which means you can register using the username and password issued to you 
by your organization. Just begin typing your organization name in the box as shown here and it uh, sh should be automatically generated. Click continue and your normal organization login page will then be uh, displayed. You will then be able to log in with the usual username and password you would use to log in. All you need to do then is complete the registration form and agree to the end user license. If you are not a UK academic user or your organisation does not appear on the list, then you can check the box in the bottom left hand corner that says my organisation is not listed. You can then follow the link to request a username. Just enter your email address and we will send you a one-time code. Enter the code into the box at the bottom of the page and we will contact you with a username and details of how to complete your registration. We aim to get back to you within five working days. Once you are registered with us, you are free to download and access the data which we have spoken about today, as well as many others through the use of our catalogue and other search tools. If you wish to find out more about how to search our catalogue, please sign up for the webinar on the 20th of November from 11am to 12.30am. Apologies, that was the 20th of November. You can sign up for this event via our events page on the, on the website. The webinar will go through in more detail about the processes of finding and act accessing data, different access requirements, and what you need to, to know to search and find the data. <clears throat> we also have resources to help you figure out how to use the data that we provide. There is a section of the website dedicated to this. We want to see data used to its maximum potential. So to help with that, we offer these resources. The Learning Hub section of the website contains information, advice and support to enhance your data skills, including teaching with data. The New to Using Data section may be useful to those who are using data for the first time. It includes best practice and training for researchers who are new to accessing the data in our collection. It also includes advice and tools to correctly cite data. If you're going to be using quantitative or secondary data from us, do have a look into that. In the middle section on this slide, you can also see that we have data skills modules available. These introductory level interactive modules are designed for users who want to get to grips with key aspects of survey, longitudinal and aggregate data. Modules can be completed in your own time and you are able to dip in and out when needed. They give an introduction to key aspects of the data using short instructional videos, interactive quizzes and activities using open access software where possible. Each module stands alone, but those with little experience of surveys might find it useful to start with the survey data module before moving on to the longitudinal data module. We also offer guidance for using real research data to bring teaching and learning to life. You can use our extensive teaching data collections and resources to support your teaching and learning. 
They have been designed to allow students to analyse the data from our collections containing key variables and topics of interest. We have worksheets and specific guidance for those teaching data. When you are ready to explore our help pages, click on help on the right hand side of our website, just under the, under the login button. Now, this is designed for both new and existing users. You will see on the screen that it is categorized under different sections. You can see that there is a section dedicated to registration and login FAQs and how to register. There is another section entitled Advice for New Users. Here you will find information about citing the data, tips on how to search the catalogue and the importance of the data documentation and the FAQs how to get data and access information section covers questions you may have about data for your project how to download the data and questions about variables the secure lab section is a guide to all things involved with downloading and accessing controlled data via our secure lab platform. The different types of data section covers much of the same material that we have discussed today in this, in this webinar. The exploring data online section covers tools that can be used to explore data including including Nestar, Stat, the integrated census micro data tool, historical population reports, links to the National Archives and links to other tools discussed in this webinar such as Wicked, in Infuse and others. How to deposit data has links to how you can deposit data or share syntax with us by a re-share and how to pre a prepare data for this process. Searching for data discusses tools we have available for searching for data such as Qualibank, Hasset and the Variable and Question Bank. Other Data Providers is a series of links to other secure, secure research facilities, ready-made statistics, question banks, qualitative data data providers, other open data resources from around the world, international data providers, international data archives, and a link to the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives catalogue. Finally, we'd like to draw your attention to the Contact Us section of the website. Here, you can also be directed to the help page for frequently asked questions. If your question is not answered there, then you can continue down the page to, the, to get in touch with our team on Help Desk. If you choose this option, you'll be able to complete a web form to inform us about your query. These are set up to be directed to the team best suited to help you. This may be our technical team if you have a technical issue or our user support team if you have a question specific to a particular data set. We do try to respond to all queries within five working days of receiving them. So please do try to explore our FAQs first 
as the answer to your question may be there. Also, you could find something related that you are interested in but had not thought of. As we near the end of this presentation, we are just going to take a quick look at some further resources and help. We have compiled a small list of links for useful resources, such as our, our, our YouTube channel, where this webinar is being live streamed. There is also a link to our data catalogue if you would like to have a browse through our repository. The help desk web form mentioned in the previous slide and the browse data page. You can also find out more information from the codes shown here. So we'd just like to say thank you for listening today. We've listed a few uh, methods of contacts here and our um, X feed for you, as well as our news section. And um, there's a box at the bottom of that page where you can uh, register to receive our newsletter. We've also linked there to our data impact blog. So thank you everyone and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for coming. We hope the information has been useful and we hope that you will be able to search the catalogue and find the data you need.